this morning. We've walked through the book of Jonah for the last three sessions, and today in the fourth, we're in chapter four. If you have your Bible, uh, we're going to wind Jonah up, and uh, we will. I won't preach every uh, topic or issue that Jonah surfaces, but I, I wanted to hit some of the highlights of it and uh, and let you share in the information that Jonah left us about life, etc. Thursday night, I, I felt like the sermon was a groundbreaking sermon, at least for me. Uh, I preached on the subject of, of living in a new normal, about how things around us are so radically different and changing. Uh, the world that I grew up in and the world that we live in today, it's almost like I don't know where what happened. Uh, I feel like I just popped in here from another planet somewhere and trying to make this world work with the values and culture and the norms and things I grew up with, that the today they just are. It's like I had a poster one time, a poster some, some people gave me. It said about the time, I, it was a picture of this little monkey and he was all frustrated and, and discouraged and you could tell. And it says about the time I think I found some answers, they change all the questions. You know? and, and life is like that. It has changed so much. And we're living... Uh, in a time of cyclical change. And uh, now, folks, I, I'm not going to get political here this morning, and I don't want to talk about climate change and those sorts of things, but the climate has always been changing, and we're in cycles. Now, I, I ask, I'm sure we, that, that mankind, I, I'm sure we're not helping things out, but it's always cyclic, it's cyclic. I've uh, you know, I'm a gardener and a farmer, and I know sometimes you have wet years and sometimes you have dry years. And, and they usually run five to seven year cycles, it seems like. And so I, I'm not saying there is no such thing as climate change because the, it is getting warmer. And we know that, but we, we don't know why. But what I'm trying to say is that there's not just climate change that we're going through. There is so many things. Uh, radical liberalism in religion is cycling through. Now what I'm trying to say is, if you'll notice, the pendulum will swing. It will swing way over here to liberal, and then it'll swing back to, to a conservative. It, it, over the you know cycles, it swings because it's trying to find a normal, but it'll swing. And right now, we're in a time of liberal uh, the, religion and theology. Society has gone crazy right now with political correctness. I mean, I don't know hardly what to say. You know what? It would bother me if I cared, you know. <laughs> But you know, you get my age, you just don't care anymore. About it. If I offend you, then bye. See ya. You know, I had fun, but uh, hit the road, Toad. You know, I don't care. <laughs> you see where I'm coming from? I mean, I love you, but but I've, I've done this before. This ain't my first rodeo, you know. So it seems like we're going crazy on political correctness. And uh, I don't know. anyway, we're seeing the economies of the world printing trillions. I'm not just talking about American economy. But the, the, the economies of the of the world, China and and uh, other places, Europe, are pr uh, printing trillions of dollars in euros and yens or whatever uh, that aren't backed up by anything. Just money based on. You know what our money is based on today? Consumer confidence. That's all our money is based on. It's not based on anything else. And uh, what happens when we lose confidence in it? Well, it's a cycle. Again, those sorts of things are cycling. The families. Uh, the, the family, in, since World War II, the family has been under attack. Did, are you, did you know that? And I'm going to sound awfully old all of a sudden. But when Mama went to work back after World War II, this nation has never been the same. When Mama left the house and left the kid raising to somebody else, and um, it, this world, we've changed it radically. And uh, it's, it's amazing. The faith, our faith, and the Bible is under attack. Uh, our cities are battle zones, and our, our police and our military are under attack here in our own country. And, and, and all those things bother me a great deal. Now, here's what I preached about Thursday night. I've only scratched the surface of the cycles we're in. Now, here's the thing that really hurts me, hurts me and, I, and, and you need to hear this. Folks, it's never going to go back like it was. We're never going to go back. I, even though we're cycling, let's just say it ever cycles back, it won't be in our lifetimes. And it won't be in our children's lifetime. And it may not be in our grandchildren's lifetimes. So things are going to always be different. 
the different than we've ever seen them before. We've got to learn how to live in a new normal. Now, I'm not going to re-preach Thursday night sermon, but I want you to, to get a little bit of that understanding because I have to say that again and again. I spend too much emotional energy and intellectual energy trying to figure out how to get us to go back like things used to be. And it's a waste of my time and yours. You understand what I just said? Mm -hmm. It's a waste of our time to try to figure out how to go back and fix things, make things like it was. Because it, ne it ain't never going to be like that again. It's all going to be new and different. So what we need to figure out is how to live in a new kind of normal. What is normal now? Well, we need to learn how to live in it. And I don't want you just to survive. Just to survive. I, I hear people always talking about, well, we're survivalists. We're just going to hunker down and hoard and buy guns and, and we're just going to survive. Well, folks, there's one way. Surviving is one thing, but I don't want to just survive. I want to thrive, don't you? I want to live. I want to be a blessing. I want to help somebody else. I don't want to just take care of me. I want to help somebody else. I want to be a blessing. So I asked that question then Thursday night. How do we do this? Now, I'm going to leave that, and, and we're going to take this concept and this thought and this kind of idea with us, and we're going to walk into uh, Jonah 4, 4th chapter. <clears throat> Let me tell you about, a, bit, a little bit about him. He was a prophet, a Jewish prophet. Now, get this. He was a legitimate Jewish prophet. Jonah was, and he was written, spoken about in other uh, places. Isaiah, I think it was Isaiah, spoke about him. Jesus mentioned him. So he was a legitimate prophet. Now, get this. And God was calling his him, he called Jonah, Jonah, go down and preach to the Ninevites. Preach to those people. Because they had forgotten about the true God. And they were worshiping the gods, the fallen gods, who were opposed to the Most High God. And set about to institute this, this new world where Jehovah God was forgotten. So when Jonah preached to the people of Nineveh, and, and I, I want to repeat myself again by telling you the greatest miracle in the book of Jonah was not the fish and the, and the man staying, being spit out of the belly of the fish. That was exciting. That was an interesting miracle. That was not near the size of miracle as, as what happened when Jonah preached to the city of Nineveh. You know what happened? They repented. An entire city. We say, how many people live there? I don't know how many people is there. The Bible doesn't tell us. But it says there was 120,000 people in the city that didn't know their right hand from their left hand. Children. See, I mean, and, and, and uh, maybe people that weren't mentally uh, with it or something. But nevertheless, there was 120,000 dependents. So I'm saying there was, who knows. But there was. it was the largest city on the planet at that time, sister city to Babylon, and Jonah went there to preach, and there was a revival swept through that city, and it, they were they repented in sackcloth and ashes. In other words, they turned back to God. Every one of them. And that's the great miracle. And then what happened when they turned back? God changed His mind. And we're going to talk about that today. God changed His mind. I think it says in the King James that God repented His mind. In other words, God didn't repent. It's just God changed His mind. He thought about this in a new way. <clears throat> that is amazing to me that an entire city would return to the Lord. Now, when God is forgotten in any culture, in any family, in any life, when God is forgotten, what you have left is, is you have hell on earth. I'm going to give you a, a little formula that I've used for fifty, for forty years or whatever, in preaching and teaching, and that formula is where Jesus is is heaven, where Jesus isn't is hell. Now you take that into your home. If Jesus is in your home, it's a heaven on earth. When you live by the law of God, when you put others first, and when you live by those those, those things Jesus taught us and Sermon on the Mount, etc. When Jesus is there, it's heaven on earth. But you take Jesus out of a home, what do you got left? You got hell on earth. And you know what I'm talking about. It's where he is, is heaven. Where he isn't, is hell. <clears throat> now that carries on in life, but it also goes into the future, into eternity. So, like Nineveh, many Americans have forgotten God. Our nation is forgetting God. We're becoming like Nineveh. And uh, God's going to know about it. God already knows about it. And then He's going to uh, judge us. In fact, I think we're already in judgment. I'll have more to say about that later. So what today, I want to I want to try to help us think about this question. of uh, What have we forgotten about God? What is it that that is sliding out of our memory? And I don't mean just 
our, our intellectual memory, but what is sliding out of our, our practice of life and our, and our families? What's slipping away from us as we have forgotten God, as we're moving into this new world that's coming, this new normal? What is, the, what is, being, what is being forgotten? The first thing that I want to talk about is in the book of Jonah, chapter 4, verse 1, is that God gets to set the ethics and the values and the rules. We don't. Now, in America today, we're trying to change all the rules. And, and boy, it scares me because it's like we're just blatantly throwing out the old rules, the rules that God has set in place, and, and, and we're just throwing them out with abandon and we're adapting our own rules. But I want to say to you, God sets rules, we don't. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became angry. What seemed wrong to Jonah? That God forgave the city of Nineveh. That seemed so wrong to Jonah. You see how Jonah's ethics and his values got all twisted and out of, out of shape? Jonah didn't want, <laughs> down deep in his heart, he didn't, he didn't want Nineveh to repent. He wanted them to burn. You know, he, if he'd had a button and he could push and a nuclear bomb had gone off in the city of, of Nineveh, I'll guarantee you he'd have pushed the button. He didn't like Nineveh. God sent him down there to preach to them. He didn't want to go and he didn't want them to turn. He didn't want them saved. He didn't want them forgiven. He wanted them gone. And so when God changed his mind and repented and saved the people of Nineveh and forgave them and pulled back their judgment, Verse 1, Jonah, it seemed very wrong with him. And what did he do? He got mad about it. Well, who did he get mad at? He got mad at God. A prophet got mad at God because God was gracious and loving and kind. How can God's will seem wrong to us? I asked myself that question. And I, then I, I think I found a few answers. How can God's will seem wrong? Well, let me ask you, what about if when it goes against your personal preferences. Oh, 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 What about when it goes against your personal preferences? God's will is a... What if it opposes what you like and what you want? What, how, how you want to do things? What if that opposes God? Well, we get we don't get frustrated. But what about if it seems to violate your sense of right and wrong? And I'm going to show you some instances later of, of how that... How sometimes God's will, permissive will or whatever, can violate what we think is right and what is wrong. Um, what if it goes against the prejudice that we've carried in our heart? What if God loves some... What if we're prejudiced against something God loves? Oh boy, this is not going to be a fun sermon, is it? I can see that right now. <laughs> what if it's something you've, you know, you've set a prejudice against in your heart against or for or whatever and it goes against God? What are you going to do? Well, are you going to crawl out, sit down on a hill and pout and hope to die? That's what Jonah did. What about if it uh, violates your narrow view of cultural norms? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me elaborate some of this stuff because I, I, get, I don't want you to miss any of these subtleties of this. Do you realize that there are people who have come to the stockyards to Sock River Cowboy Church and have been extremely offended by, because we wear hats in church? Yeah. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially on at the first. Oh, I can't believe you people would wear hats there in the house of God. Well, this ain't the house of God. This is a stockyard. <laughs> this could just as easily be Battlefield Mall. Do you understand? This is not sacred space. You say, really? You mean this isn't sacred space? No. There, is, there isn't any sacred space in any church in Missouri. There's no such thing as sacred physical space. Do you know where the sacred space is? It's in the heart of the believer. Amen. We are the temple of the Lord. Yeah. Right. We are the ones that carry that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the stockyards is a safe place for people to come and, and go to church and they just, you know, they can get off their horse from rounding up cattle in the morning and and come to church and, and uh, they don't have to worry about getting all the hay off their hat and shoulders. You know, and they come right in here. We don't care, do we? Yeah. And they might get other things on their boots and things. We don't care. Come right on in. We, we're, see, there's, we, there's a church. We need a church. This area is desperately needed a church where people can walk out of the dairy barn and, and come 
Oh, and, you know, it's a hurry because you don't know think about milking. I mean, it's pretty regular work. Did you know that? <laughs> pretty regular work. And and people who milk, they there's not many dairies left. But you, when we started, there were. But you could come right out of the dairy, uh, run by and, and spray off a little, and then come right on in here and worship. Uh, and we need cattle people that raise cattle to need a space to worship with other cattle ranchers. And and you know, even this morning, I. Been on a tractor already this morning, fed hay, and and you know took care of cattle. I mean that's what farmers and ranchers do, and we need a place where we can come to church and 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 however we want to not have to, to gussy up and wear a tie, right? Amen. Um, we believe, and, and I'm gonna say it again now. We believe, or I believe, and practice that the people of God are the church. We are the church. You and I are the church. And if we were to meet in the stockyards, then we're a church, and, but we're meeting in the stockyards. If we meet in a, an event center, a building we built off campus somewhere, and, and we meet there, we're, we're, the, we're the church. But when we walk out of that, that's just an event center. Are you with me? It's not sacred space. There is no sacred space on planet Earth except in the heart of man. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But let me say also, we are a cowboy church. You know what I'm going to talk about, don't you? You know where I'm going with this. We're a cowboy church. We're different. Uh, we're here to reach a different group of people than the normal traditional church. Please don't hijack us. Please don't make us be a traditional normal church. And I know the tendency there is so tempting. And some of us do it subtly. We don't even realize we're doing it. And I, I want to tell you a story. I've told you a thousand times. You heard about the, the people that left the church because they didn't like the way they were doing church down there. They weren't meeting my needs. They weren't feeding me. So they went to the other church. And they got in this new church. Boy, they liked it. They got in there and they got, well, this new church is meeting all my needs. They were there about six months and they tried to turn the new church into the one just like the church they left. Now, you know what's going to happen when you get this church turned into the church just like the one you left? You're going to leave this one. Because you don't like the way it is now. Let me say something right now. Do us all a favor and just leave right now if you don't like Cowboy Church. All right? There's a lot of good churches. A lot of good churches. And I mean that with, with, with a deep uh, love and appreciation. Go to those churches if that's what you want. Don't turn this into something else. Let this be a Cowboy Church. One time, granddaughter and her new husband were going to have Easter lunch. She was fixing the meal for the family. She got the ham out of the refrigerator. She cut the ends off the ham and measured it, made sure it had the right length and cut what she didn't need on the other side. She cut it off. And her husband said, why did you cut the ham off like that? Why didn't you just cook it? She said, I don't really know. She said, let me call mom because mom always did it that way. Let me call mom because maybe, you know, so they call mom. Mom, why did you cut the ham off a certain way? And she said, hmm, I don't know. Grandma always did. <laughs> Let's call Grandma and see why she cut the ham off a certain length. So they called Grandma and said, Grandma, why did you cut the ham off in a certain direction? She said, well, I had a little bitty pan in it. And it went up this very big. Three generations of people were cutting the ham because of Grandma's little bitty pan. All right? So I, I hope you get... <laughs> I hope you get what I'm trying to say here to you this morning. Don't make Cowboy Church cut the corners off the ham just because somebody else did it that way. Okay, now, I think you're getting it. Many of the things, many of the things we do have as Christians, now listen very, very carefully to this. Many of the things we do as Christians has no biblical basis. Not based in the Bible at all. Are you with me? I'm going to talk about some of them now. We do them because tradition tells us that's how we ought to do them. Grandma did it that way. Grandpa did it that way. In this new normal, it has become, so, and, and it's become so mixed in with our faith that without evaluating it and without thinking about it, we have amalgamated tradition in with our faith, and it has become literally impossible to practice it and make it work in this new normal. Are you with me? In the old normal, maybe some of it worked, 
But as we go forward into a world that's radically changing, we're going to have to be crystal clear on what is tradition and what is real biblical practice. Please listen to me. I'm going to offend some folks this morning. I'm going to get ready. Just get ready. I'm going to offend you. I planned on it coming in here. And, and remember, there are a lot of other good churches if you don't like what you hear this morning. All right. <clears throat> Believe it or not, well, let's, let me just start like this. My wife and I grew up in families, especially my wife's family, that were opposed to dancing. If you danced, buddy, you went straight. You probably left the dance and went to hell. I mean, it was, there was no, don't pass, go, go straight to hell. You don't get to go. You're, no matter how much you've been saved or how many times you've been baptized. And the reason was cultural. We came to a Puritan, Puritan, Puritanistic time in America when, when things were, you know, I don't want to get into all that. You know, my wife and I didn't even dance at our wedding. I, I, we didn't even dance at our wedding. Nobody danced at our wedding. The most, uh, anyway. You know why nobody in my family dances at weddings? Or dances, period? Because my grandmother and my grandfather were kicked out of a church because after church on a Sunday night, they went to church on Sunday night, after church on Sunday night, they went to some other young couple's homes and they danced. They square danced. And they kicked them out of the church. Oh. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> they kicked my grandma and grandpa out of the church. Nell and Jim Hyder. Because they danced in somebody's home. And so, you can imagine in my family, dancing is just, you just don't do that. Right? Okay, you get where I'm coming from. Believe it or not, Believe it or not, Jesus probably danced. You know why? All Jews danced. Every Jew danced. They went. That was how they expressed joy. I mean, they would. You ever watch Fiddler on the Roof? They grab a shoulder. Hava Nagila. I mean, they danced. That's what Jews did. I mean, so yeah, that's what. I can't dance because, I, but I'd like to. But I just can't dance. I mean. And you can't dance with a body like this. The timing, the timing not mine. You know, it's just ugly, so I can't do it. Oh my. In a culture, also in my culture, you didn't drink alcohol. I sent you to hell immediately. And again, there's just no grace to cover it, ever having a glass of wine or beer. It just wouldn't, God would never forgive that. And then I read the Bible, found out the first miracle Jesus ever did. He turned water into wine. <laughs> you can imagine my confusion and frustration. Um, and another thing we did in our family, we never played cards with faces on them. If it, if it had a face on it, you didn't play that card. Mm -mm. But we played rook every night and every day. That, you know. So I just want you to see some of the things we think are cultural and Okay, Jonah, in his religious life, the Gentiles were, were bad people. They were bad people. Hebrews, God's chosen, holy people, but Gentiles were bad. And now all of a sudden, God had come and messes up Jonah's world. Because Jonah thought he and his religion and his people could set the rules and the values on life. But we found out God gets to set them the values and rules of life. Jonah's, Jonah disagreed with God and he got mad. And, and uh, so be careful that when you try to follow the Lord, and, and all of you, I promise you, everyone in this room wants to follow the Lord. That's what your desire is. I know that. That's why, that's why you're here. Make sure you, when, you tip, when you follow the Lord that you don't impose your preferences and your traditions or even your culture on the rest of the church or, or even in your life. Make sure you're following the Lord completely and not other things else. Okay, so what we learn about God is that He gets to set the rules and we're asked to adapt. And, and the, but the next thing is life changing. I want to talk about verse 2. And this is life changing. This one, And this is probably one of the greatest truths I'll ever preach to you this morning is that God changes His mind. 
I, I don't know if I can get this all preached this morning. I, I, I doubt if I can even touch it. But I want, you to, I want you to know, God changes His mind. And that is wonderful news that I have for you this morning. Because there's no other God that ever changes His mind. There, you know, the, the false gods. None of them ever did. Let's read verse 2. Chapter 4, verse 2. He prayed to the Lord. Isn't this... This is Jonah quoting the Lord. Jonah says to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home before the fish ate me? All right. I added that part. This is what I tried to forestall or keep from happening by fleeing to Tarshish. I, here it is. I knew you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Jonah was mad. He was having him a little fit. And he was mad at God. I can see, God told you, God, if I went to Nineveh and preached to them, this is exactly what you'd do. You'd forgive them and change your mind and I'd look like a fool. That's what he's saying. I preached to them until they repent. And I went down and I preached and they repented. And you let them off the hook. Well, that's what God does, folks. He lets us off the hook. When we repent. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. God changed his mind. He's going to burn that city. But after they repented, he changed his mind. Hallelujah. Wow. Now that causes a lot of people, especially I love the theologians to try to deal with this. They say, well, how can an omniscient God, omnipotent and all that, how can he ever change his mind? And I'm thinking, I don't know. I can't figure that out. I just take it on faith. That's the only idea. He changes his mind. I'm going to tell you exactly why God changes his mind. And that is because he has chosen to give you and I free will. Listen carefully. God chose to give you a free will. You can say yes or you can say no. You can repent or harden your heart. God says you can do either one and I'm going to react to your free will. When God reacts to our free will, it appears that He's changed His mind. It's not. He's not changed His mind. He's just been very consistent with His true nature. His true nature is justice and judgment and forgiveness and mercy. Can that two, can those two things go together in one God? Not in a normal God, but our God's not normal. <clears throat> He's the only God, the supreme creator of the universe. He sets the rules we don't get to. <clears throat> now, it's an amazing truth to know that God's judgment is passive and not dynamic. Now, please stay with me. I've thrown a lot of stuff at you, but this is a, a new concept I want you to get. God's judgment is passive. What does that mean? He doesn't force it on us. He doesn't sit up in heaven and say, I'm going to send judgment on those people now and kick their little hind ends because they've not been doing what I've told. No, God doesn't do that. He sets the rules, and His rules are, you run and hit that wall as hard as you can run and run your head into it, it's going to hurt. Yeah. That's a passive rule. You with me? I just gave you a passive rule. I'm going to try it. Somebody want to try it? Get up and run <laughs> as hard as you can and run with your head into that wall and tell us what happens. All right. Well, it's going to hurt, right? That's a pet. So I'm going to say, so God says, don't run into the wall. Okay, God, I won't. But if you do, it's going to hurt. God says to America, live by my law. Live by my rules. Let me set the rules. You live by my way, and, and I'm going to bless you. It's because blessings come when you live by my way. Blessings don't come when you run into the wall. Blessings come when you stay back here and you sit comfortably waiting and trusting God. Do you see where I'm going with this? America has put its head down, closed its eyes, said I'm going to turn my heart and my back on God and I'm going to run into His wall. <coughs> you with me? The passive judgment of God is coming on us because we have set it in motion. We've caused it. The Ninevites, they repented. Wow. In truth, it wasn't. It, it was God that had changed His mind because they changed their mind. Okay, if we choose to walk away from that kind of love, listen very carefully, God will change His mind about your living with Him in heaven forever. If you walk away, He'll let you. I guess that's what I want to say. If you want to go to hell, He'll let you. Do you know God never sends anybody to hell? Did you know that? He has never sent anybody to hell. Not one, ever. Everybody that goes to hell goes there because they choose to go there. When you were born, I'm going to tell you a little killings with theology. I, mean, I, I believe that when every person on, that's ever lived on planet Earth, when they were born, their names was written in the Lamb's book of life. Every person. 
God wrote it in heaven in the Lamb's book of life. And He sent you. He says, here you go. Your name's in it. You want to go? And when people decide not to go and they get to heaven, their names are removed. We didn't accept my invitation. I could send you an invitation to come to my house for a party and I'd put on an RSVP. If you're coming, I need to know you're coming. That's what being saved is. It's answering your RSVP. Yeah, I want to come. Make a place for me, Lord. I want to get there. But if you don't send in an RSVP when you get there, we'll be, you won't get to go. It's that simple. His love has covered enough sin to cover the world. Oh my goodness. This is way too much sermon to preach in one morning. Let's try to close this down. Let's read verse 3. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. That's Jonah still reacted to God's love and mercy. <laughs> God's still mad because God forgave him. Jonah's still mad because God forgave him. Verse 4. But the Lord replied, replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city, and there he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. He went out there to watch it burn. He had him a ringside seat. He, he, boy, he had a first class ticket. He wanted to watch Nineveh go up in smoke. He was sitting there grinning. I can just see him. But he was, well, he wasn't as mad, you know, because God had not done it yet. And time passed anyway. Verse 6. Then the Lord, <clears throat> then the Lord provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. Okay. Here he was, sitting out there a long time. No nuke, no bombs. This city's not, it's repenting. They're having revival. People are coming to the Lord. I mean, they're getting, you know, getting saved. It's a city is coming. It's a city of joy. It's a city of, it's Philadelphia. It's a city of brotherly love now all of a sudden. And Jonah's sitting up there just fuming. It just matter and a wet dog. I mean, you know, he's, he's sitting up there and, and life is just... And he sat out there in that hot sun and God said, poor little Jonah, I'm going to grow a vine up over him. And God grew a vine up over that pouting prophet. God made a vine grow so he'd cool him off. How do you like that, Jonah? That shows some love, doesn't it? But you know what happened? God also sent a worm the next day to kill the vine. <laughs> <laughs> God's got a sense of humor, hasn't he? <laughs> All right, let's read this. Uh, lesson verse 7. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. Verse 8. So the sun rose and God, and God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die. And he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said. And I'm so angry, I wish I was dead. Verse 10. But the Lord said, listen carefully, you've been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. And, and should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left hand. And the last word in the book of Jonah, for you farmers and ranchers, and so many animals. I didn't need to preach another sermon on that. God cares about the animals. He was aware of them too. And so many animals. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. No matter what happens to us, it's His normal. God is the same. Jonah was mad because God saved the city. He loved his reputation. Listen now. He loved his reputation and his religion more than he loved the people of Nineveh. Man, what, a, what an indictment on a preacher of God. God loved and protected Jonah even though when he, when he was acting like a fool. Acting like a fool, God still loved him and protected him. You and I are living in a time of absolute radical change. We can never forget what God can do in the midst of change. We can never forget what God can do in America. Never forget what God can do in your life and in your heart and your family. Don't forget it. All we have to do is repent and return. Now see, God can bring protection and prosperity in our lives depending on how we live. 
how we live by His rules. So stop looking back to the way things were. It's a waste of your time and mine. It's gone forever. Look to Jesus. Why? Because He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. Live in ways that bring the blessing of God on your life. You can live to bring a blessing or you can live to bring a curse. You live in ways that bless God.